and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, compared with my children, most of my childhood was pretty car-based. So I'm going to talk tonight about how I got into active transport, why I believe it can benefit Bendigo, and what I see as some of the challenges. Going up around 20 kilometres from central Bendigo, I didn't go too many places without being driven as a child. I remember aged nine or 10 visiting a family friend in Flora Hill who didn't have a car. I was amazed. How did they manage to get around, I wondered. I guess they walk a lot, catch the bus, get taxis, my mother answered. For me, it was unimaginable. Two or three years later, my family spent a year in Sweden. We lived in Uppsala, a university town of 125,000 people. We didn't have a car. We walked to school, caught the bus or rode our bikes into town, and Dad cycled to work. Many families seemed to get around this way. The city had a good network of bike routes and a good bus network. Suburbs were fairly compact, but there was plenty of open space and pockets of forest. This is Uppsala, just from um, Google Earth. <laughs> and here's Bendigo. As a 12-year-old in Uppsala, I loved being able to get around without my parents having to drive me. And I'd like to think children in Bendigo could enjoy this experience too. But back in Australia, I didn't ride my bike much again until I moved to Geelong for university. It took me a while to feel mobile on two wheels. Initially, I thought that riding three kilometres to uni was a pretty big deal, and I couldn't imagine riding six kilometres into town. But one day I did, and I found it wasn't so far after all. Realising I could actually go places by bike was quite liberating. Oops. Since then, I've become increasingly passionate about active transport. I love the way it helps me wind down after a stressful day. I love the way it gets me out in the fresh air, engaging with the day, the elements, my surroundings. I love the social aspect, the contact with others in my community, and of course the health benefits, getting regular exercise without having to find time in my day for a workout. I moved back to Bendigo with my family five years ago, having spent 20 years in Geelong and Melbourne. And one of the main reasons for leaving the city was traffic. I, in Melbourne, I grew to dread the smog that would hang around on still clear days. This, along with the noise, the time it took to get around, and the fact that buying in Melbourne would mean living a long way out and almost certainly being car dependent made staying in Melbourne for us pretty unattractive. Uh, it was lovely moving back to Bendigo, where the air smells clean, where you can be out of town in a matter of minutes, where it's small enough to get around easily, yet has everything you need. It's a pretty livable city. Traffic is a major threat to Melbourne's livability status. That city prides itself on being among the best in the world. But how livable is sitting in a free, on a freeway for two hours a day? Or not being able to walk across your suburb without crossing a six-lane arterial road? While the traffic in Bendigo is nothing compared to that in Melbourne, there was noticeably more, uh, there is noticeably more now than when I left 25 years ago. Obviously Bendigo's grown in that time. And as we continue to grow, I think it's really important to have this conversation about what we want Bendigo to look like. If we don't consciously plan for alternatives, if we stay with the status quo, we may find ourselves inadvertently locked into a car-based system where it's more difficult to foster alternatives, where our roads are more congested, where we need to spend millions on building new roads, new car parks, and where traffic threatens the very things we love about Bendigo. I was very pleased to see Trevor addressing those issues. If we don't want Bendigo to become a mini Melbourne, I think we need to set up alternatives to car-based transport. And like Trevor, I'm not suggesting that we get rid of cars altogether, but by fostering alternative transport options, it will give us choice and limit the negative impacts of car traffic. Many people I know wouldn't even think of using their car less. Like me as a child, the idea of getting around any other way is unimaginable. Driving in Bendigo is so easy, so accepted, so dominant. And because we don't see alternatives being modelled very much, these alternatives, cycling, walking, public transport, they seem a bit fringe and, well, difficult. 
especially with kids. Getting around is more complicated with children, especially once they start kinder and school. And not surprisingly, many parents, particularly mothers, spend a lot of time driving. Often it seems the only way to get back from the swimming lesson in time for the kinder pickup, or whatever. <coughs> Trouble is that even when the kids are old enough and probably willing enough to walk or ride themselves, the car is all they've ever known. As we know, kids are more sedentary than they've ever been, and obesity is a massive issue. If kids don't walk, scoot or ride when they're kids, it's going to be much harder to develop that later on, develop those habits later on, especially if they're overweight. Meanwhile, mothers at this stage in life often have little times for themselves. It's hard finding time to exercise and they start putting on weight too. For me, walking or cycling for transport forms the bulk of my exercise. I rely on it for weight control and for sanity. Likewise, riding to work is great exercise for my husband who otherwise sits at a desk all day and it means our family manages with only one car. But it hasn't all been plain sailing. Oops. When, when we moved back to Bendigo, we wanted to be somewhere where we weren't car dependent. So we bought near the Spring Gully, Spring Gully Creek, a lovely kilometre and a half walk from the local primary school. And when we moved there, I imagined that of course we'd walk to school. Well, I'm sorry to say that we drove there for much of my daughter's first year. With the adjustment of starting school, the tiredness, I was pregnant again and we had a, I had a three-year-old who didn't care for hurrying and it was just too hard. In my parents' generation, walking a kilometre and a half to school might have been normal. And I think that's a key point. It might not have been easy, but when it's normal, when everyone does it, when it's expected, people support each other and figure out how to make it work. When you're the only one or one of the few carting your kids around in a bike trailer, you can feel quite conspicuous and different. When the school mums meet for coffee after dropping off the kids, they might drive five minutes to a cafe. But that five minute drive might be a 20 minute ride. They could meet somewhere closer, but when a, a driving mentality is dominant, it's not a consideration. So the cycling mum misses out. Sometimes it just seems easier to drive like everyone else. It takes some commitment to keep riding when it isn't the norm. But it is something that matters to me. In my daughter's second year at school, there she is, we started scooting home once or twice a week and my son rode one way to or from kinder. Yet we were still driving more than I wanted to. My back was sore from lifting the baby in and out of the car and from reaching in to do up seat belts. I never seemed to have any other time for exercise and every time I forked out $80 for a tank of petrol that would be used mostly for short trips, I'd resolve again to walk more. I devised an incentive scheme for our kids. For one month, I told them, I'll put a dollar in a jar for each trip we don't use the car and at the end, we'll share the spoils. The kids, fortunately, embraced the scheme and though we still went by car on days where we had after school activities, we were driving much less. Coming home together became a lovely time to chat without distraction. In town, we parked and walked instead of driving between shops. And by the end of the month, we had $32 in the jar and our petrol bill was cut by a third. I'm pleased to say that riding remains our default mode for getting to school. My daughter, now eight, is disappointed when we drive. My two-year-old is desperate to ride his balance bike, which does mean we get home a bit more slowly. My six-year-old boy, on the other hand, would be more than happy to drive every day. He's not particularly sporty and still doesn't care for hurrying. We always ride, he'll exclaim. Yep, I reply, which is actually a lie. So we'll all get to be outside on this beautiful day and we're not spending money on petrol and we're not polluting the air. Sometimes I offer to drive him if he hands over the $2 for petrol. He hasn't called my bluff on that one yet. But otherwise, it's just not negotiable. Just like brushing teeth, which he also complains about. It's just what we do. I've been heartened to see more parents riding to school with their kids. With more of us doing it, it becomes more normal. It's social and it's a positive reinforcement for the kids. For people who think walking or riding isn't possible for them, my answer is start small. Start with what's manageable. Maybe it's just one trip this week that you don't take the car. It could be just walking between the shops in town. 
Once you start thinking about what's possible, you might be surprised at how many dollars you get in your jar. I think there's already plenty of scope in Bendigo to encourage alternatives to car-based travel. There's already walking and cycling infrastructure in place and potential for more. And with a strong sport cycling culture, bikes are already well established and accepted in our city. But here's another sticking point. For many people, the idea of riding in traffic is scary. And it is if you've never done it, just as driving in traffic is scary for new drivers. But learn some principles of riding safely in traffic and it's not so bad. Seasoned commuter cyclists know the tricks of riding safely. They know, for example, how to turn right safely at a multi-lane intersection, how to claim their space on the road, where to stand at traffic lights so that drivers can see you. And they know the best way to get from A to B, to ride from A to B. Chances are it's not the same route they would drive. Just as learner drivers have an experienced driver to teach them safe driving techniques, novice commuter cyclists become safer and more confident riders with support from experienced cyclists. But unlike driving, this is not normal practice for bike riding. In Melbourne, I developed and taught a series of cycling skills workshops for women, and I saw what a difference learning safe riding principles can make. Women who had been too afraid to ride on the road, who perhaps didn't have very good bike handling skills, were now empowered to ride in traffic and to do it safely. By equipping people, adults and kids, with skills to ride safely and confidently, and by providing appropriate infrastructure, we help make active transport a real option. It may never replace car-based travel, but if it's a viable option, but it's a viable, if it's a viable option as part of an overall transport mix, we all benefit. Physical health, mental health and social benefits are obvious for those actually doing the activity, but even die-hard drivers stand to win from a policy of encouraging active transport. More walking and cycling trips equals fewer cars on the road and fewer of trying to find a park. That means less traffic congestion. It keeps our taxes down because bike and walking infrastructure costs way less than car infrastructure. And perhaps more importantly, it might help make Bendigo an even more livable city. Thank you. <coughs>